And we are recording. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, we're here from the Counseling Center, and we're happy to present our new workshop called Befriending Yourself with Self-Compassion. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Blake, and uh, my name is Gayatri Titus, and we are going to be talking with you today about what self-compassion is and how we can practice that with ourselves. Before we get started, um, we just want to review informed consent. Um, so this workshop, as well as our other quick access virtual workshops through the Counseling Center, are intended to be psychoeducational in nature, and they're not designed to provide any sort of mental health treatment or emergency response. Um, we encourage you to visit our website or call us to learn more about the mental health treatment options that we are offering to students currently. If you are experiencing a mental health emergency, such as active suicidal thoughts, please visit our website to learn more about the emergency resources in your area. Resources may differ based on your location. This workshop is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube account um, and other online venues. So to get started, being a college student, as you probably already know, is pretty challenging. There's all kinds of things that play into stress levels as a college student. Um, there's, of course, the big one is adjustment, so transitioning into college. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to adjust to, living potentially with a roommate, um, having distance away from maybe your support systems. Um, there's just a lot of adjustment. And that can happen every semester too, as each semester changes. You also have your assignments and exams, um, the pressure to choose a major and career path or paths. Um, then the changing nature of our friendships, relationships, family, um, those can experience uh, some challenges uh, while you're in college. Then you have works for some students who might be working, um, bills to pay, um, time management skills. There's just a lot of different things going on and uh, sometimes it can feel like you're um, like someone at a circus juggling um, balls or pens and college just keeps throwing you one more at a time. Um, but in addition to that, currently, COVID-19 has made things even more challenging. Um, so with our physical and environmental health, um, we have changes in our daily routines and habits, um, health concerns, we're at home more often, there's uncertainty about what home looks like. Um, academically, we're learning about the pandemic, um, health and safety, um, the challenges learning has changed how we do academics. Um, COVID-19 has also impacted our social life. Um, so it's uh, created changes in how we connect with people in our support system and uh, probably has impacted your travel plans or social events that you've had planned. Emotionally, there can be a lot of uncertainty, fear, and anxiety, um, even frustration and grief regarding COVID-19. And then spiritually, we're all trying to make sense of this, whether it's through um, religion or spirituality. Um, we're trying to just understand um, our place in the world right now. And then occupationally and financially, um, some folks may have lost jobs, um, maybe experiencing increased exposure as an essential staff, or maybe you're working from home. So COVID-19 has added uh, even more challenges to being a human. Thank you, Blake, uh, for sharing uh, the stressors that college students uh, most often experience. Um, we also want to talk a little bit about additional stressors that may be faced by ethnic minority college students. Um, and these stressors are in addition to the exams or the writing of papers, the academic stressors, so to speak. And sometimes uh, 
people who are from ethnic minorities uh, report experiences with racism and discrimination. Sometimes they will talk about the traumatic stress that they've experienced, um, differences in the lens that people approach education with. Um, and also, uh, they often cite experiences of where they might have heard insensitive comments or question whether they belong on a college campus or not. Uh, so these are some additional stressors that might be experienced uh, by students uh, in addition to all the academic uh, stressors that we just discussed. So uh, what else affects our ability to have compassion with ourselves? Here we want to sort of discuss a couple of things that came to our minds as we were uh, writing this workshop. And one of the things that we are noticing in our times today is uh, social injustice. And this is where people might experience events or what people might say or do that make us feel not good enough. Um, and that can affect uh, whether we are compassionate to ourselves or we're hard on ourselves. Uh, the second factor that could affect our ability to have compassion with ourselves is historical oppression. And by this, we are acknowledging maybe the messages that we have received across time and generations about who we are in society or who we are uh, in terms of uh, our culture, um, our ethnicity, uh, our race. The third factor that sometimes affects our ability to have compassion is our personal experiences. And in this, we think about all the messages and the feedback that we may have got from people that we have interacted with um, and that influences how we feel about ourselves. And in these messages, we look at things that we've received from our family. Um, sometimes we might have received the message that we're not worthy, or uh, sometimes we are, or sometimes we're not lovable. And that affects um, our ability to be compassionate with ourselves. Uh, we also hear about experiences or messages that we may have received while we were in school or college or uh, you know, where we've interacted with our peers or people we work with, our friends, where we might have received the message that we're not cool enough or we're different or we're not like them. Um, and sometimes those messages get internalized um, and we are less likely to be compassionate with ourselves. Um, also, uh, sometimes we uh, look at how people perceive ourselves and we are in a hurry to agree with that perception and we sometimes don't create that space or give ourselves that permission that that's their perception of us. We don't have to agree with it. And sometimes we discount ourselves when we agree with a negative perception and that too can affect how compassionate we are with ourselves. And finally, um, we uh, live in this world of technology where we are surrounded and immersed in social media and uh, we hear stories and uh, we see depictions of what maybe celebrities look like or what their lives look like. And uh, sometimes that affects how compassionate we can be uh, to ourselves or how kind or loving we can be to ourselves uh, and we might be too harsh to judge ourselves uh, if we engage in that sort of comparison. So one of the quotes that we wanted to share with you is written by a poet called Rumi and uh, it's a quote that we like and uh, Rumi says, your task is not to seek for love but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. And so we wanted to share this quote with you uh, as we work with you on this journey of how we can 
understand what gets in the way of practicing self-compassion and how we can work towards having greater compassion for ourselves. Thank you for sharing that quote with us, Gayatri. Sorry? So thank you for sharing that quote with us, Gayatri. Thank you, Blake. Uh, and so we'd like for you to think back uh, for a moment about when a friend has reached out to you for support recently. And as you're thinking about that uh, moment, we'd like for you to think about how you responded to your friend. What were some of the things that you said or did for your friend? And how did that make you feel um, showing up for your friend, providing that support? Um, oftentimes, we treat our friends with compassion in moments of suffering, but when we t take a moment to think about how we respond to ourselves, we may find that there are barriers in the way um, or challenges uh, with treating ourselves with that same sort of compassion that we would treat a friend with. So we're going to watch the short clip um, that focuses on how to be a friend to yourself at its core is what self-compassion is. Trying to be a better friend to yourself sounds like an odd idea initially because we naturally imagine a friend as someone else, not as a part of our own mind. But there is value in the concept because of the extent to which we know how to treat our own friends with a sympathy and imagination we seldom apply to ourselves. If a friend is in trouble, our first instinct is rarely to tell them that they are fundamentally a shithead and a failure. If a friend complains that their partner isn't very warm to them, we don't tell them they're getting what they deserve. We try to reassure them that they're essentially likable and that it's worth investigating what might be done. In friendship, we know instinctively how to deploy strategies of wisdom and consolation that we stubbornly refuse to apply to ourselves. There are some key moves a good friend would typically make which can provide a model for what we should ideally be doing with ourselves in our own heads. Firstly, a good friend likes you pretty much as you already are. Any suggestion they make or ambition they have about how you could change builds on a background of acceptance. When they propose that you might try a different tack, it's not an ultimatum or a threat. They're not saying that you have to change or be abandoned. The friend insists we're good enough already but they want to join forces with us to solve a challenge they feel we would properly benefit from overcoming. Without being flattering, good friends also constantly keep in mind certain things we're getting right. They don't think anything wrong with the odd compliment and emphasis on our strengths. It's quietly galling how easily we can lose sight of all our own good points when troubles strike. The friend doesn't fall into this trap. They can acknowledge the difficulties while still holding on to a memory of our virtues. The good friend is compassionate. When we fail, as we will, they are understanding and generous around our mishaps. Our folly doesn't exclude them from the circle of their love. The good friend deftly conveys that to err, fail and screw up is just what we humans do. We all emerge from childhood with various biases in our character, which evolve to help us cope with our necessarily imperfect parents. And these acquired habits of mind will reliably let us down in adult life. But we're not to be blamed because we didn't deliberately set out to be like this. We didn't realistically have a lot of better options. We're indelibly required to make big decisions before we ever really understand what's at stake or how our choices will play out. We're steering blind in all our large moves around love and work. We opt for a move to a different city, but we can't possibly know whether we're going to flourish there. We have to select a career path when we're still young, and we don't know what our later needs will be. In long-term relationships, we have to make a commitment to another person before we understand what it will be like to tie our lives so deeply to theirs. The good friend knows that failures are not, in fact, rare. They bring, as a starting point, their own and humanity's vivid experience of messing up into play as key points of reference. They're continually telling us that our specific case might be unique, but that the general structure is common. People don't just sometimes fail, everyone fails, only we don't know about it. It's ironic, yet essentially hopeful, that we usually know quite well how to be a better friend to near strangers than we know how to be to ourselves. 
The hopefulness lies in the fact that we do actually already possess the relevant skills of friendship. It's just we haven't as yet directed them to the person who probably needs them most, namely, of course, ourselves. So that video um, does a really great job um, with explaining um, what self-compassion is. So some of the points that the video made um, is that self-compassion is no different from showing compassion for others, um, except that it's directed towards ourselves. And um, some of the core pieces of self-compassion, as noted by um, Kristen Neff, who is a researcher on self-compassion, um, is that self-compassion requires that we notice and acknowledge the suffering or pain that we're experiencing. And this is uh, different from uh, how we might normally respond by ignoring or avoiding that pain. Then after we've acknowledged it, we're going to engage with ourselves empathically. Um, compassion literally means to suffer with. So showing ourselves some empathy in that moment. And then offering understanding and kindness rather than judgment or criticism. And then holding some awareness that suffering, failure, and imperfection, um, even though they're all challenging and frustrating experiences, are shared components of the human experience. And then finding ways to honor and accept your humanness. So now we're going to watch um, a video clip uh, where we see Dr. Kristen Neff uh, talking about the three components of self-compassion. And Kristen Neff is uh, known, um, is very well known for her work on self-compassion. So we invite you to uh, listen to what she has to say. So how do I define um, self-compassion then? I really don't see a difference between compassion for self and others. I define them exact, the exact same way. I argue that self-compassion has the components of a sense of kindness, kindness, care, uh, understanding for yourself versus judgment, a sense of common humanity versus feeling isolated and cut off from others. Um, and then a sense of mindfulness, right? being aware of the suffering that's occurring versus over-identification, which again, I'll just clarify this in one moment. Let's go through each one separately. Okay, so self-kindness versus self-judgment. Kindness is more than just um, hearts and flowers, okay? Kindness has a very active um, component to it. It means when you're kind to yourself, you really want to comfort yourself when you're suffering. You want to alleviate your suffering. You want to soothe yourself, okay? It's a, it's a very active um, stance where I want to do whatever I can to help myself feel as good as possible in this moment, okay? Common humanity, um, really framing one's own experience in light of the common human experience. It's very funny, if I were to ask any of you, you know, are a human being? Are you a human being? Yes, of course. Is everyone else a human being? Yes, of course. Does everyone else suffer? Yes, of course. You would say that logically, but in the moment when you just blew it at work, or you had someone reject you, or something really bad happens in your life, what happens non-rationally is that we get very egocentric. We feel like, why me? This is somehow has happened to me. I'm the only one who's messed up. I'm the only one who's going through that difficult time. And we feel really cut off from others. It's as if somehow when things go wrong, that's abnormal. You know, this is not supposed to be this way. Something has gone wrong. But you know, is that the case? Has anything gone wrong? Is anything abnormal? No. 
You know, that's what life is. Life goes wrong. No one in here signed a contract before you got, you know, born in this world saying, I would be perfect, my life would be perfect. And yet it's like, this is not the plan I signed up for. I'm pissed off about it, right? That's how we, that's how we react. Um, the problem with that, and there's a lot of problems with that, but one of the main things is when we feel isolated and cut off from others, you know, physiologically, that's very frightening. If you, if you think evolutionary, what, evolutionarily, one of the worst things that can happen to us is to be isolated from the group, because then we aren't safe. Um, and it's interesting, this aspect of well-being, I don't think has been studied enough. This sense of can we feel connected to others in our suffering, or do we feel isolated from others in our suffering? And just, I can tell you, in the workshops I've conducted, especially the eight-week ones, at the end, I ask people what they got out of this the most, almost every single person says common humanity. I realize it's not just me. It's not just me who judges myself. It's not just me who suffers like this. Very important to remember that this is the human experience. This is how things are supposed to be. Okay, there's nothing has gone wrong. Yes, it's painful, but it's normal, it's natural. And then this is where the mindfulness comes in. Um, you have to be aware of your suffering in order to give it compassion. So um, mindfulness allows you not only to notice your suffering, but very important, and we'll talk about this more, to be with your suffering as it is. We don't like to be around suffering. If we could just get rid of pain, you know, we'd do it. Um, and we have lots of psychological mechanisms to avoid that, again, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. So self-compassion says, wow, pain is occurring. Can I turn toward that? Can I be with that? And you actually need to do that to be able to give yourself the caring and support you need. All right. Now, some people do say, come on, you have to notice your suffering. Isn't it like blindingly obvious I'm suffering? But it's often really not. Um, the pain caused by self-judgment, I think in some ways that's some of the worst pain all of us experience. You know, constant, niggly, niggly pain. I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not this enough, I blew it, I'm this and that. But often we are so lost in the role of self-critic that we don't really stop to realize, oh my God, this is really, really hurting. You know? And in some ways it feels more comfortable to be the self-critic because at least the self-critic isn't the person that messed up. <laughs> You know, the self-critic knows you messed up. The, per the part of you that feels really, you know, vulnerable and insecure and a failure. Um, often we don't give that sort of side of the um, process as much attention, okay? And then also very um, important when things go wrong in our lives, very often we go straight into problem-solving mode. It's like, there's a problem. I don't want there to be a problem. Need to fix the problem, you know, immediately. Um, and what happens is we go straight into problem-solving mode and don't stop to, again, turn towards the suffering and say, whew, this is really hard, this is difficult, I need a little, I need a little care and compassion to get me through this, then we, aren't, we really aren't at our best and are most psychologically stable when we go um, towards trying to fix that problem. Okay, so it's actually something you have to remind yourself to do before going straight into fixing problems to just acknowledge and validate how difficult the situation is. All right. Um, so that was Kristen Ness talking about self-compassion. And so we want to spend a few minutes maybe inviting y'all to reflect a little bit on what that would involve in our daily life. So she talked about how it's important to practice kindness versus self-judgment. And when we practice self-judgment, sometimes we add that layer of shame or that layer of self-criticism or do we even deserve this? And uh, we want to invite you to consider that, yes, it is totally okay to be kind to yourself, to, be, to embrace yourself to embrace your pain and to acknowledge it, just like you would do with a, a good friend of yours that came over or who was going through a rough time or needed some advice or just wanted to talk with you. Uh, and so how can we practice kindness during this difficult time when we feel rejected or hurt? You know, what are some steps we can take or things we can reflect on 
but it first starts with the acknowledgement that we all deserve to be kind to ourselves um, and sort of put that lens of self-judgment on the side. The second thing that she talked about was common humanity. And that's a really important concept because we're not alone. We are all going through experiences that might differ, but we all suffer in some way or the other. Um, and so it's important to acknowledge that we have the shared humanity um, versus feeling like we are alone in our pain or nobody gets us or nobody understands. And, and this, having said that, we, we want to acknowledge that this is a difficult time with COVID-19 and we are all trying to practice this safe distancing and um, social distancing could be, a better word would be physical distancing. We don't have to socially distance from other people. We can reach out to other people and uh, talk with them. Um, even if their experiences are different from our own, we don't have to suffer alone. Uh, and the third concept that she talked about, the third component is being mindful um, of our emotions and thoughts. So, uh, you know, sort of to acknowledge their presence, to experience it versus drowning in it. So we can learn to swim in it. Uh, we can try maybe a different stroke that would keep us afloat um, instead of sort of being swept away by that emotion. And uh, sometimes it's useful to take a step of being uh, an observer to our situation and also participants. So taking a step back and noticing what we're going through, uh, whether it's in a relationship or whether it's something that's going on with us. Um, and then we also want to point out that it's really important to pay attention to the language that we use when we describe our emotions. So saying I feel angry versus I am angry sounds very different or I feel disappointed versus I am a disappointment is very different. There's almost like a shame component when you say I am a disappointment or it's almost like a label that I am angry versus something that we're feeling, uh, you know, and we're acknowledging that feeling with kindness. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about what self-compassion is not. Uh, Self-compassionate certainly is not having pity for yourself. Uh, Self-pity uh, would look like maybe where you're focusing on yourself, your struggles, you're disconnecting, you're sort of drowning in that, uh, you know, gosh, there's no hope here, or there's nothing good, or um, I'm not worthy uh, in any way. And that's where we can stop and be mindful on a continuum if we recognize that that's the continuum we're going on. Maybe we can press the brakes here and say, okay, wait a second. Uh, there's a different way of doing this. Uh, we can acknowledge ourselves and uh, be compassionate to our own pain and acknowledge it with some kindness. Uh, Self-compassion is also not self-indulgence. Uh, it comes from a caring place, a place where um, you know, we show ourselves that warmth like we would to a friend, uh, where self-indulgence would feel more like we want an immediate gratification or, uh, you know, we're walking away from overall wellness and maybe trying in that moment to distract ourselves from our pain. Um, maybe sometimes we, you know, engage in uh, some choices that sort of distract us, but that's not self-compassionate. It sometimes can damage us or hurt us in some ways. And so to be mindful of what steps we're taking um, and whether that is self-compassion or not. And then self-compassion is also not self-esteem. So self-esteem, uh, you know, focuses on the evaluation of the self. Am I, am I worthy enough? Am I good enough? And we want to invite you to consider the difference uh, between self-esteem and self-compassion. Self-compassion encourages your self-worth because you're human. Uh, you don't have to meet any standard or any basic requirements uh, to say, okay, now I have reached this point where I can be self-compassionate. You can be self-compassionate anytime because you are human. 
uh, and you don't have to meet any external criteria uh, that says, okay, now you can show yourself love. Uh, that's not part of it. Um, so that it, that's the difference between self-compassion uh, and self-esteem. I really want to share some reminders. Um, as you are practicing self-compassion. Uh, so one of these is that self-compassion is not going to take away or eliminate difficult emotions or experiences. Again, that's part of being human, unfortunately, is that we're going to experience pain and suffering. Uh, but what self-compassion can do is provide different ways of responding, ways that feel more supportive. Um, Another thing uh, to remember is that trying to control or suppress our emotions or thoughts might actually increase them. Um, the more we avoid, uh, the more those things might persist. Um, Kristen Neff uh, discusses what she calls the backdraft effect. So by practicing self-compassion, we may actually increase our feelings of discomfort at first when we begin to actually start acknowledging our emotions. So you may find that there, um, as you're practicing self-compassion, that a lot of challenging emotions start coming up. And these may be emotions that you've been trying to avoid or control or suppress. And as you're practicing self-compassion, you're giving yourself the opportunity to connect with those emotions and to show them compassion. Um, so just be aware that that might be something you experience. And as always, if you are feeling overwhelmed, allow yourself to take a break. That in itself is an act of self-compassion, giving yourself a break. So asking yourself, what are some ways that you can ground yourself? You know, um, maybe asking yourself what you might be needing in that moment. Um, it could be to go outside and go for a walk or to um, contact a friend or play with a pet or a video game or uh, maybe uh, drink a glass of water or take a nap. Um, just kind of checking in with yourself, asking what is it that you might be needing in that moment. And then um, as Gayatri was saying earlier, these practices of self-compassion can be incorporated into our day-to-day -day life. We don't have to wait for anyone's approval. Um, we can start practicing self-compassion right here, right now. Um, and that can be uh, in small incremental ways. It doesn't have to be this sudden shift um, into becoming a self-compassionate person, but um, little um, acts at a time. So one acronym that I wanna share with you all is that, um, the acronym CALM. And this can be a helpful way to guide yourself into um, experiencing a difficult moment uh, or moment of suffering. So that starts with being curious. So being curious about what you're experiencing in the moment, noticing with mindfully that pain or that suffering. Um, so practicing mindfulness and being curious. And then being accepting, holding acceptance for the fact that you are human and you are experiencing a moment of pain right now. And that's not fun, it's not comfortable, but it's part of being human and it's okay for you to experience difficult emotions. And then moving towards loving compassion. So how can you practice that self-compassion? What is something that you're needing in this moment? What are some kind words or uh, ways of practicing understanding or forgiveness that you can uh, share with yourself? And then moving towards your values. So you're in this moment of suffering. You've, hold, you've held some acceptance for yourself and you've also are practicing self-compassion. How do you want to respond moving forward? Uh, what in your values or what feels important for you that can let you know um, how you wanna respond moving forward. And that in itself can also be a way of practicing self-compassion 
and giving yourself the opportunity to uh, stay connected to your values and what's important for you uh, despite challenges. And so um, this is another step-by-step -step on how to take a self-compassion break. Um, and then after this slide, we will go through um, a short activity um, that will um, help us uh, practice that. So again, starting off with a self-compassion break um, involves acknowledging that this is a moment of self ways for you to mindfully connect with that suffering. This could look like saying, wow, this really sucks right now. Or, oh, this is really uncomfortable. I'm really anxious right now. I'm feeling really frustrated. Just kind of labeling mindfully what you're experiencing in the moment and not holding any judgment for yourself. Um, just being objective about what you're experiencing. And then noticing that suffering is a part of life. Um, by, and reminding yourself that you're not alone in the suffering, um, and that other people also experience similar experience, uh, feelings or experiences. Sometimes this can be done by simply placing a hand over your heart and just feeling the warmth of your hand as you're practicing self-compassion and reminding yourself that it's okay to be human. And then as you're doing that, reminding yourself to be kind. So asking, may I be kind to myself? What do I need to hear right now to express kindness to myself? Or maybe it's a, a prayer that you have. May I learn to accept myself as I am? Or may I be patient with myself? Whatever it is that you're feeling the need for in that moment, um, asking yourself, how can you take a step towards that? And it doesn't have to be a big step. Maybe it's a small step. Um, but just giving yourself the opportunity to practice that in the moment. Thank you, Blake, for sharing that. And as I was listening to you, um, I, I love the word where you put this is a moment of suffering. And I think to remind ourselves that it's not going to go on forever. It's a moment and how we can acknowledge that moment. So I, I really we really love that word there. Um, we want to invite you all to participate in an activity, a compassion activity. And so maybe if you can find a place that you would be comfortable, um, you know, sit in a place that's comfortable, that feels right for you. Um, and think of a person in your life uh, that you have come across, and it could be from your family, it could be from your friend circle, or it could be even somebody that you may have met uh, or never met, maybe never encountered, but know through a, you know, some sort of experience of maybe an email or anything. And think of think of the person, think of a person who has been kind and compassionate to you in your life. Now, if you could spend a moment maybe thinking of some of the challenges that you have recently been struggling with or that's been troubling or worrisome to you, um, something that you've been trying to deal with or solve, um, a problem maybe that you just want, you, do you just wish this problem would just leave you alone? Um, but it, it sort of is still looming. It, sort of keeps hanging on your shoulders and weighing you down. Um, and so if, if you're comfortable, close your eyes um, at this point and imagine the person uh, that you picked in your experience that has been kind and compassionate to you. And think of this person um, in your mind and take a few moments to perhaps imagine if this person knew what you were going through, uh, knew what you were struggling with, what would this person say to you? 
what sort of kind message would this person give you or remind you of? And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes if you had closed your eyes. And we want you to take a moment to get in touch with your feelings. How does it feel to know that there is a person who could show you some kindness and some compassion during a difficult moment or a difficult time? How does that make you feel in your heart? And as you get in touch with these feelings, we want to invite you to think of how could you in turn be kind to yourself? And what are some of the messages you might want to give yourself to reflect that kindness, reflect that compassion, that love for yourself, um, setting that judgment aside and truly being present with you uh, and yourself in that moment um, with loving kindness. So we hope that this activity has been uh, useful to you and we want to invite you to practice this activity uh, in moments of your life or times that you might feel alone or you feel maybe like nobody understands you or you're critical of yourself, we hope that you will practice this activity and think of somebody who is kind and compassionate in your life and what they might say to you. So thank you for doing that with us. Uh, here uh, on this slide, uh, we have uh, our services uh, that we offer. And we offer phone consultations. If you are interested in learning more about our services, uh, please feel free to call and schedule a phone consultation uh, by calling 828-262-3180. If you're looking for referral options or other resources, you're welcome to call us. We also uh, offer tele-counseling uh, uh, and you could schedule a phone consultation with the same number um, and you would have to fill out an informed consent form that can be found on our website. Uh, we also offer emergency services. Uh, if you are in the Boone area, you can contact us. So there's Daymark Recovery Services. Uh, if you're outside the Boone area, then you can check crisis solutions nc.org to find out any local crisis support uh, teams. Um, and then there are some additional numbers that you could call uh, for any support. Uh, we also offer workshops. Um, they call our quick access workshops. And then we have feeling good workshop series. And you're welcome to go on our um, counseling uh, center website and learn more about what is being offered currently. We also have Let's Talk. Um, which is now offered as Let's Teletalk uh, via Zoom. So you're welcome to come and uh, sort of participate in that. That's a little different from counseling. It's more like you're seeking a consultation with uh, the clinicians that work at the counseling center. We also have a lot of virtual recordings of workshops and information that can be found on our Instagram, Facebook, and on YouTube and on our website. And if you want to get some resources on how to practice some maybe self-help, then you can visit our website and we have a lot of uh, information on uh, different topics ranging from coping with COVID-19, anxiety, stress, sleep, grief, um, mindfulness, meditation, eating concerns. So we hope that you will take a moment uh, and visit our website uh, if you're interested to know more about these services. And additionally, here are some resources. 
that can support you in your journey of practicing self-compassion. Uh, as Gayatri was saying earlier, um, we offer quick access workshops. And one of those is called Kind Mind, and it focuses on developing self-compassion. We'll actually be starting that uh, workshop series uh, this month, uh, July 2020. Um, and you can check our website out to find more information about the Kind Mind workshop series. Um, and then research shows that, uh, with, like with anything, practice uh, helps things become easier um, the more we do it. And so Kristen Neff on her website uh, offers self-compassion exercises as well as meditations um, that can be helpful to practice. And those can be found at selfcompassion.org. Um, and there'll be two tabs that um, provide information about the exercises. Um, some books that can also be helpful is the Self-Compassion Skills Workbook, workbook by Tim Desmond. Um, Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself by Kristen Neff. And then the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook, A Proven Way to Accept Yourself, Build an Inner Strength, and Thrive uh, by Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer. Here are some of our references. We just want to say thank you for attending this workshop or viewing this workshop on YouTube. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact the Counseling Center. Um, like, a, like we said earlier, our names are Gayatri and Blake. Um, and if you are watching this on YouTube um, and you are interested in um, receiving extra credit or attendance verification for extra credit, um, just contact us for an evaluation form. Uh, once that evaluation form has been completed, we'll send you um, attendance verification um, for watching the workshop. Um, and in terms of time, uh, we, are, uh, we would normally offer a 10-minute guided meditation on self-compassion. Um, but I'm not sure if we have the time. Gayatri, what do you think? Um, I think I'm okay if you want to share it. Okay. Um, so we could either play it now or just offer students to check it out on their own. Sure. Okay. Um, so, yeah, if you go to YouTube and you want to practice this on your own, um, this is a 10-minute guided meditation for self-compassion. Um, and... We hope that you check it out and continue that process in exploring self-compassion. Thank you so much, Blake.